go ahead and uh, introduce our, our speaker here now. And I'm going to have to do this, otherwise I can't do it. So as soon as Rainy gets her first slide up. State Geological Survey here tonight with us. Rainey has her bachelor's in geology and an MS in physics at Stanford, and her PhD is from, she's a cop over, so from the University of Wyoming, uh, where she specialized in alluvial sedimentology. She's worked in coal bed natural gas, drill rigs in Colorado San Juan Basin. She's poked around the Utah uranium industry, that I'm sure was very interesting. You can ask her later. Uh, she spent several years studying carbon sequestration, probably in the Green River Basin, I would guess, there. Mm -hmm. um, and since joining the Wyoming State Geologic Survey in 2012, she has focused primarily on oil and gas research, delving into the details of not so well documented hydrocarbon systems throughout the state, and participating heavily in their state map program. She spends most of her free time trail running, and she's exceedingly serious about her trail running, like uh, tens of miles worth at a shot, mountain biking, and resurrecting some of Laramie's historic homes, which I'll have to learn more about later. She began managing the Wyoming State Geologic Survey Energy and Minerals Resource Division, Division in late 2017. So she is part of the people who get very little money from the state government that are, uh, in my estimation, very responsible for the fact that we don't stay, pay state income taxes in this state. So I'd ask you to uh, join me in welcoming somebody from the Wyoming State Geologic Survey, Rainy Lenz. Thanks, John, and thanks for the invite. Um, can everybody hear me? All right, all right, great. If you can't, flag me down. Um, I, I really appreciate um, you asking me to come here. This is, it's really fun to talk about some of the work that I've been doing lately in the Greater Green River Basin. I'm happy to take questions along the way, especially if I'm not explaining something clearly. Please just stop me and um, ask me to explain it better. So uh, I, it, I was looking at this title earlier and I realized um, that I probably should have uh, should have uh, time quantified this a little bit more. Um, the geologic history of the Greater Green River Basin is, uh, is, is, is immense. <laughs> um, and um, what I have really been looking at lately is the late Cretaceous, so mostly from about 100 million years ago to about 66 million years ago. And so that's what I'm gonna be focusing on. Um, and so one of the reasons, so there's a couple of reasons why we really want to um, understand geologic histories of basins, whether it's the Greater Green River Basin or, um, or other basins in the state or elsewhere. And one of those reasons is that um, it's really important that we uh, understand how and the timing of um, continental deformation. So um, continents deform at scales, at time scales that are much longer than the length of a human life. Uh, so we have a lot of trouble observing um, continental deformation, but it does affect us in terms of earthquakes, you know, volcanoes, um, river avulsions, things like that. So um, we have to a lot of times look into the past to be able to understand sort of what's happening now. Um, and the other reason is that is that when we have continental deformation, a lot of times we have basins forming, and basins actually hold um, a lot of our resources. Um, they hold our oil, gas, lots of uranium. Um, they also hold our, our groundwater and our surface water. Um, so, so these are really important structures to be studying. Um, so this is the geologic map of Wyoming, and I know you can't... Um, see it, but I hope that, um, or you can't actually read it all, um, but I hope that you can pick out um, a few patterns in it. Um, and when I look at it, some of the patterns I start to notice are that there's big expanses of brown areas. Um, so these are, these are the basins in the state, the Powder River, the Bighorn, the Wind River. Um, there's this big, you know, green area. This is the greater, or, sorry, this is uh, orange area. This is the greater Green River Basin. 
um, and the Denver Basin down in this area. Um, and then you can, so oh, actually I'll, I'll simplify that map a little bit more here. Um, so this map is showing just a few of the key features from the last one. So we have again our basins highlighted in, in gray, but then you can see in brown here, these are all the mountain ranges around the state that have um, crystalline rock at their core, so that have igneous or metamorphic rocks. And then the green are all the places where there are Cretaceous rocks exposed at the surface. All right, so essentially what we're seeing in this map is that there are large basins generally flanked by um, Cretaceous age rocks on the sides and then in other places, in other parts of them, um, there are areas where there are um, these um, mountain ranges that have a crystalline core. So we'll keep coming back to this theme as we move through here. But I do want to talk about oil and gas reservoirs in the state for just a second to highlight the importance of studying um, these basins and especially the Greater Green River Basin. In 2017, um, there were about 74 million barrels of oil produced in the state of Wyoming. Most of it was in the Powder River Basin, which was responsible for 38 and a half million barrels, um, followed by the Greater Green River Basin at just over 13 million, the Bighorn at 10, which this used to be the big um, oil producer in the state um, about th 30 years ago, no longer, uh, followed by the Denver Basin and then the Wind River Basin. And when we look at the formations from which this oil was produced and, and try to categorize them by um, age of formation. Um, so I've tried to lump them together here. Um, so we know that, whoops, that the um, Paleozoic rocks, so rocks that are 541 to 419 million years old, produced about 25% of the oil in the state. Um, does anybody recognize this photo? It's one of the only ones I have from near this area. <laughs> this is from the backside of Targi. Uh, off of Fred's Mountain. Uh, let's see, uh, lower and middle Mesozoic, these are a lot of the red rocks throughout the state. Um, they only produced about 2% of the oil. Lower Cretaceous, 3%. You can see where I'm going here. The uh, upper Cretaceous was responsible for 70% of the oil produced in the state. Uh, this, is, this is a really big number, obviously. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're looking at at rocks of this age. If we look at natural gas, uh, it changes a little bit. And uh, natural gas, uh, the state, we produce 1.77 TCF, that's trillion cubic feet of natural gas in the state last year. Most of that was from the Greater Green River Basin, uh, which was just over one TCF of gas. Uh, followed by the overthrust belt, in this area. Um, and then the Powder River Basin, a lot of this is uh, gas associated with some of the oil, some of the oil fields in that area. Uh, and then the Wind River Basin, and then really minor amounts in the Bighorn Basin and the Denver Basin. So this is you know, another reason why we're very interested in the Greater Green River Basin. This is one of our big um, gas um, plays in the state. All right, so I'm going to go back to the, I'm going to show you this Google Earth image of the state and um, again try to highlight some of these major, um, some of the major mountain ranges throughout the state that are, again, that, that have rocks in the center of them that are um, metamorphic or igneous. Um, we could, these are Precambrian, which means they're old, they're older than 541 million years old, so we call them Precambrian cord basement uplifts. Uh, and you'll notice that they're all throughout the state. These are just some of the main ones, and they're surrounding the Greater Green River Basin. There's um, a set of mountain ranges that I, hopefully you'll notice are not shown on this. They're not highlighted. Um, and that would be the overthrust belt in this area. So. The reason I didn't put it up first is because I really want to make it clear that the overthrust belt is a different type of mountain range than the rest of the ones in the state. Uh, it, is, it, is, um, it doesn't have Precambrian basement rocks in the core of it. It's, it's folded and faulted sedimentary rocks and it, they are a lot younger. They're all younger than 541 million years old. 
And so, as you can see, the Greater Green River Basin down here in southwest Wyoming is really affected by um, these types of, these Precambrian Basement Core Mountain Ranges on the east, the north, and also the south. But on the west, um, it's, it's a different type of mountain range. And so we've been interested in trying to understand how this relates to the formation of the uh, Greater Green River Basin. And one of the ways we've been doing that is through um, a program called State Map. And uh, I just wanted to put this slide up to make you all aware of this program. This is a, uh, this is a US Geological Survey program. So this, these are federal funds um, that they give to state geological surveys. We apply to do maps. Um, and so they, they, uh, they're, they're matching funds. And we've been part of the program since about 1994. Um, through that time, the survey's done 75 maps at the 1 to 100,000 scale, which are these, these bigger ones shown on here, and um, 30 maps at the 1 to 24,000 scale, which are these the much smaller ones. Um, and that's what I've been doing lately, these 1 to 24,000 scale maps. So they're a lot more detailed than the, than the, than the larger maps. Um, this doesn't mean that, so in places up here, there are some of these maps. They do exist. Um, they may have been done by the U.S. Geological Survey and not by us through the state map program. All right. So lately, we've been doing a lot of mapping out here on the very east side of the Greater Green River Basin. Um, there's a nice series of outcrops here that are sort of, they crop out along the whole edge of the basin. And the formations that we've been mapping are shown here in this strat column. And this, um, so essentially what I'm showing you here, this should be a very tall column. We had to break it in the middle and put half of it on the right side. So we're looking at age here on the left. So we're looking from about uh, 84 million years going up and then you go back to here. So here's 70 and we're going up to um, 56. And these are the formations. So the steel shale, the Mesa Verde group, the Lewis shale, Fox Hill sandstone, Lance Formation, and Fort Union Formation. Um, these are the same formations we see over and over and over and, and we're mapping and we get to really see how they change um, over large distances. And so um, a, lot of, a lot of the mapping has occurred within the Mesa Verde group and so I'm gonna start here and show you um, some of these rocks um, in this area. So, the Mesa Verde group was deposited, uh, oh wait, and this is how you know you're in, you live in Wyoming when you call it the Mesa Verde and not Mesa Verde. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure why, <laughs> but we have to go with it. Um, so it was deposited, or at least the early part of it was deposited entirely underwater. So this is a reconstruction um, of, of um, so this is where Wyoming stood during the late Cretaceous when the Mesa Verde was being deposited, there was a large western interior seaway through here um, and it was sort of right on the edge of the, you know, uh, land water interface. Um, so the reason why Wyoming was underwater then was, uh, was twofold and I wish I had a prop to help explain this, but one reason is um, if you take, so, so the crust is effectively weak. Okay, so if you take the crust of the, the, of the earth and you weight it down, you put a mountain range on it, that's, that's a heavy weight. It's gonna actually deflect under the weight of that mountain range. Um, so if, you know, this is the mountain, I'm deflecting the crust, I push it down, I make a hole. Um, and as the mountain keeps going up, it keeps pushing it down more, it keeps eroding into this hole, um, which adds more weight, which makes it deflect more. Um, so we end up making um, a very, a large hole which can you know be a basin essentially and that's what happened in the western uh, interior seaway that was what was occurring all all along here in during the um, late Cretaceous and this is just trying to show a it's like a cartoon uh, cross-section um, re reconstruction of what this would have looked like during the late Cretaceous and I've tried to show where Wyoming would fall on this so it would sort of be a line from the west coast to, I don't know, somewhere <laughs> out in, the, in Nebraska. But where essentially, this would have been the hole that was being, um, that, that was, that was, that, 
that was flexing beneath the weight of the mountain range here, the, which was on the um, western border of the state, the overthrust belt. All right, the other reason that Wyoming was underwater at this time is because global sea level was high. And so suddenly we have a, you know, a low spot and it was able to fill in uh, with, with water. All right, so back to the Mesa Verde group. The, um, the, the, or the lowest, the earliest, the oldest formation in the Mesa Verde group is the Haystack Mountains formation. This is my field assistant from last year. Um, this is a really nice view of what the Haystack Mountains formation looks like. These are all sort of bar, or I'm sorry, uh, delta fronts um, that would have been coming, that would have been shed off of this area and moving, all the sediment would have been moving out to the east. These are really laterally persistent. As you progress through time, the seaway started retracting. Um, it started um, regressing, the land prograded uh, to the east, and you start getting formations that are not so marine anymore. Um, they're a lot more fluvial, such as the Allen Ridge Formation. There's lots of coals in it, uh, and the Pine Ridge Sandstone that were deposited from about 78 and a half to 73 million years ago. And then finally, uh, I don't have quite the right picture of this, but uh, as we move into the very top of the uh, Mesa Verde group, we end up having sea level rising again, relatively speaking. We get flooding back into the western part of Wyoming, and um, we have deposition of the almond formation. Uh, this is a large bar form in the almond. almond. This is, again, marine. And um, here's a photo. This is, this is a, an oyster, oyster hash, meaning it's just a whole bunch of oyster shells um, that have that have um, been that have sort of accumulated in this location. We know oyst these oysters are uh, they require salt water to live. Um, we can also use them to help get the um, age of the rock. And then finally, as we go from about 70 to 66 million years, seaway fully retreats, at least from this part of Wyoming. Um, these white spots are kind of showing marshy areas. Uh, so no longer do we have. Um, marine deposition, we now have entirely non-marine deposition. So this is sort of a story of the seaway coming and the seaway going. Um, all right, like I said, we've been doing mapping on the east side of the basin. Uh, this is a sort of oblique view of Rollins, which is right here. <laughs> this is the Rollins uplift. There's I-80 going through here. The railroad tracks 287 goes off, oh wait, goes like that. Um, so we've been mapping off the west and northwest side of the Rollins uplift. Uh, there's the separation rim map, which is way up here in the north. Uh, Shamrock Hills, sort of more in the middle, and then Rollins Peak southwest on the southern, most southern part. These are all, all these maps you can download on our website. They're all free. And then uh, last year did mapping at Fort Steele. So if you've been to Fort Steele, you'll recognize this is the Platte River. This is, these are actually the railroad tracks. I-80 is like out here a little bit. Um, the Fort Steele historic site is here. There's not much there to see, but there's really good rocks, so you should stop there anyway. Um, <laughs> and you can really see these, these big stripes, right? The, this, is, this is the Mesa Verde group um, yet again. Um, Haystack Mountains, Allen Ridge, Pine Ridge, Almond. Uh, and we map them as part of the Fort Steele quadrangle. Um, that, that photo is sort of showing an area like in, well, that, those outcrops are right about here. And then this year, I don't have any data to show you, but I just wanted to show you that we're mapping um, a little bit farther south than we've been working in the past. And let's see, here's Bags, here's Dixon, so Rollins would be up off the map. We're farther south. This is the Colorado border. Um, this is the location of the quadra quadrangle we're working on. Um, it's called Garden Gulch. And again, it's the Mesa Verde group. Um, it's changed a lot here. There's a lot more coals. Uh, it definitely looks a lot, it looks different than what we'd seen near Rollins. Um, and then 
But uh, this, is, this is a little bit of a digression, but this is kind of interesting. Um, on this quadrangle, we're seeing, we're seeing these all over the place. And these are really, these are, oh, how can I play this? Was this going to work? Oh. <laughs> They're these cold water bubbling mud pots. <laughs> We've sampled about 10 of these so far. Um, and we're sampling them for water geochemistry. And we're, we've also, we're able to sample the gas. This is, this is a really large one. There's eddies in this thing. <laughs> they're, they're interesting. So I couldn't pass up a chance to show these. Um, and as soon as I know more about them, um, I'll definitely let you know <laughs> what the results are. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I should know here in another week or two. The samples have been sent to the lab. Uh, and then this one's my favorite one, except the video is nine minutes long and um, included somebody falling into it. But, so I decided not to show it to you. But this is cool. So we walked up to this. It's completely dry. Like, oh, it's a dry spring, it's you know, late summer, it's dry. Standing around, you hear some sounds. It, the thing fills up and starts bubbling <laughs> um, over a few minutes. Um, so I don't, know, I don't know what the rate of refill is. Um, I definitely don't understand this system. This is something we'll be working on in the future. Um, it, the, people have worked on these maybe about 10 years ago, so it'll be interesting to see how the geochemistry of the waters changed through time. Um, so anyway, that's just a side. All right, back to Rollins. So um, another map, similar ones you've seen. There's the Rollins uplift. So I'm going to show you a map here from this area. When we're in the field, we do lots of things. We do, we, like I said, we do mapping. We don't just draw lines on the map. We also look at the, we interpret the subsurface, any wells we have. Um, we also look at, um, we describe the outcrops, and we, we do lots of samples. We collect lots of samples. And so this map is just trying to show you where we collected some of our samples. This is showing 10 different samples collected on the west side of the Rollins uplift and three more over here. This is on the edge of the Hanna Basin. This was all one big basin when these, um, when these rocks were deposited. And here's my field assistant from this year getting very dirty sampling um, coal, actually. All right, so what do we do with our samples? Um, there's lots of things. Um, one of the things we really want to know um, is we want to get some, uh, some, some age control out of these rocks. And one of the ways we can do that is through zircons. Uh, zircon is an interesting mineral. Um, I've pulled this photo just off the web because this looks nothing like the zircons that we see, but um, it's really nice to see a, a good um, museum specimen. <laughs> uh, Zircons, so this one, this sample you could probably hold in your hand. It doesn't have a scale on it. The ones that we see look like this. And I realize this is a little bit blurry. I'm sorry about that. Um, but you can see here, this is 400 microns. So this is, you know, 0.4 millimeters. Um, these, these are really small, first off. Um, nothing like these ones. But there, there's a couple of interesting things you can see in, in these zircons. In the, this pile of zircons looks different than this, that looks different than this one, right? So zircons are, they, they're usually found in rocks that are um, igneous in nature. So your, your granites, um, rocks like that. And, um, and, or, you know, volcanic rocks. Um, so you can, you can pull zircons out of any type of, of igneous rock. And when you do that, they end up having a morphology that looks something like this. So they're euhedral. They, um, they, they have a nice crystal form. All right. Um, if they come from ash, they may have um, crystallized a little bit more quickly, so they can be a little bit more elongated. But then look at these. These are like these ones are really beat up. They no longer have this nice euhedral structure, uh, crystal form to them. Um, these these Zircons have been around the block. They have, um, they've been reworked. 
They've been recycled. Um, we call them detrital zircons, like for, I don't know, detritus. Um, they're just recycled zircons. So essentially, you can have a zircon that, that forms in an igneous rock. That igneous rock comes to the surface. It erodes. Um, it you know, goes into a basin. It becomes a sedimentary rock that can then, again, come to the surface, erode. Um, so there's like the, the, some of these zircons have gone through multiple cycles. Um, and so we can, all of the zircons usually, they have um, some uranium in them, trace amounts. And we're able to use the um, uranium decays, right? And so we're able to use how much of it has decayed to, to get at the actual age of the zircon. So what, at what time this zircon crystallized in the magma? Okay, so it's been reworked potentially, but we know where it originally came from, um, what its original age was. And so we're able to date individual zircons. So I'm just trying to show an example, you know, where one might be 251 million years old, one might be 72, 987. So, so anyway, so we end up with zircons, we end up with a whole bunch of zircons and a whole bunch of different ages. And we end up plotting them in a plot that looks like this. So bear with me for a minute. So the, the plot is showing age on the bottom, right? From zero to uh, 4,000 million years. So 4 billion, all right? And this is effectively um, a histogram. So it's showing the relative um, percentage of each type of age of, for the zir of, of all the zircons that were measured for this sample. And in this sample, this is from the Haystack Mountains Formation. So remember, this is the oldest formation in the Mesa Verde group. Um, there are 297 zircons shown, represented here by these curves. And I've tried to label some of the peaks. So there's, there's a lot of zircons that, have a that are 100 million years old. There's some that are, this peak is at 1,081 million years and then 1,722. Does that make sense? OK, so now I'm going to show you for all the samples. <laughs> um, so the, the first one I showed you was right here. And what I've done is I've stacked these from, um, in terms of age. So the oldest sample here, the Haystack Mountains Formation, um, the youngest is up in the Fort Union. And you can start to see you know, that there's some patterns in some of this. You can see that there's like repeating. Um, repeating uh, high points in some of these, some through here. And what the game geologists really like to play is, you know, where did these come from? And there's people out there, luckily, who create maps that look like this. Um, and <laughs> you don't have to read it all. The point of this map is just to show you that, that there are, that the North American continent is covered by, you know, big swaths of rocks that are of similar ages. And so people have mapped out the age of these rocks and where they occur. Uh, so the you know, rocks up here in Canada are often you know, greater than 2.5 billion years old. Um, and some down here, you know, 0 0.5 to 0.54 to 0.58. Um, so, so the game we then play is, you know, so where could our zircons have come from in this bigger picture? And so Let's see, yeah. So what I've done is taken that previous map and now turned all those age ranges into colors. And so these colors correspond to these ages that were on the previous map, all right? So they're in you know, big swaths. So you can see there's not much from 2,500 to 4,000, right? Um, the one that I really want you to focus on is this green zone that's right here big word yavapai mazatzal <laughs> we'll go with 1800 to 1600 million years old okay so this this zone right in here and then so let's look at it um, in terms of percentage of zircon so this this peak right here in the haystack mountains formation represents 15 percent of the zircons in that sample are this are this age. The, the next sample above it, the Allen Ridge Formation, um, they, we have 37% of this sample are zircons from the 1600 to 1800 uh, million year old range. As we go up, 
They're almost, they're almost all above 30%. There's one in here that's 20%. So these are all greater than 20% um, uh, of zircons from this range. So we're, so the question is, where, where could these have come from? All right, so, so this, what I'm trying to show you here, this is the same sort of thing. These are, this, is a, this is a zircon age range from different um, potential source rocks um, that, that, could have, that could have fed the Greater Green River Basin. And the point, is, it doesn't really matter you know, what they say here exactly, but if you look here at this, this green range from 1600 to 1800, um, you can see that there are very few zircons in this lowest sample. There's only 5% of this is um, in the green zone. Um, and this one, 80%, up here 18% and up here 8 and so the reason I'm showing you all these percentages is because, so remember we said these zircons are, they're recycled, right? They can be recycled multiple times. But for a rock to, to, to actually recycle the zircons, you wouldn't expect the zirc, you wouldn't expect the, um, the so, you wouldn't expect the formation that it's um, being recycled into to have a greater percentage of zircons of a certain age than the original parent material. You would expect it to be less. Um, so if all of these are greater than 20%, the only one, the only potential source rock here would be this one right here, which are uh, Precambrian cord basement rocks, which are the, the mountain ranges um, that we were talking about at the beginning. And, and it makes sense, right, that we'd have um, input from the mountain ranges around the, the edges of the basin, into the basin, but that's not what we're seeing in this sample, right? This is a lot, this is a lo much lower percentage. So I'm going to make the argument that there's a big change from this sample to the rest of these samples. And so to try to put this in I don't know, a, a larger map sort of context. Um, let's, let's sort of walk through this. So this is what our argument is. So uh, at the beginning of the Mesa Verde group, in terms of, so we have the Haystack Mountain Formation. That's the, the first sample that I showed you. I'm calling this phase one, right? We just have the overthrust belt. Remember, this doesn't have any other Precambrian cord basement rocks in it. Um, this is what's feeding. Um, much of what will later become the Greater Green River Basin, but much of uh, all of Wyoming. And if we look at just an even more cartoon figure of this, oh, my gray's washed out. So let's say, so this is southwest Wyoming right here. Um, this, is, this would be land. This would be water sort of in gray. This is the approximate shoreline. So at phase one, um, during the Haystack Mountains formation, this would be our main source rocks and everything's moving to the east, right? All right, phase two, part one. <laughs> Here we go. We, we, we finally, we see these, uh, we see this, this 1800 to 1600 million year old zircon peak coming in and um, for, for various reasons, we, we are, we think that it's, input from the granite mountains. Um, we also think that the Uintas are, would be coming up at this time. Um, so we're getting, we're finally starting to see some of these um, basement Precambrian cord uplifts um, influencing the sediment. And to, to put it in this simple form, um, essentially our shoreline moves further out, moves further to the east, and um, there's potentially, you know, proto-granite mountains and the uh, Uintas. And then phase two, part two, this is where the mountains really get going in Wyoming, or this is when, when they really get going, from um, about 70 million to 66 million years. And we're seeing uplifts of, of, we're seeing all of the uplifts pretty much coming into play at this point. Um, so again, shorelines moved um, a little, it's moved further east and it's, it's going away at this time. And um, we end up with input from the Sierra Madres, um, the Uintas, the Rock Springs Uplift is going to be high at this time, and the Granite Mountains. So here's a few conclusions. Um, 
And it's that we, we think that there are you know, two main phases. The first phase is we only have one sample that captured that. Um, and that's the Haystack Mountains formation. And that's when we had the, the, just the highlands of the overthrust belt. Uh, the second phase is all the other younger formations. That second phase begins at about 78.5 million years. Um, this is earlier than previously thought. And it, and it happens when we see this influx of grains at about 1,800 to 1,600 million year old grains. And then we see this pulse again during the Lance Formation, which would be at about 70 million years old. And we see this in other basins in Wyoming and in northern Colorado, um, but they're not all at the same time. So uplifts are moving at different times. Um, they're affecting the basins differently. And essentially, um, we, 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 th this is about 8 million years older than a lot of people have thought that there was um, deformation in the Great, Greater Green River Basin. Um, and, but I think that um, our data are really um, showing that. Um, so our plan in the future, uh, next year we're going to be mapping uh, over in the Rock Springs Uplift area. And we'll be looking at some of the older rocks in this, which will help um, verify this hypothesis and um, see if we still agree with it. And then we'll also be looking at some of the much younger rocks um, to look at um, the, the more recent uplift history of the Greater Green River Basin from, well, recent, from 30 million years to the present. Uh, so I'm going to take questions on this. And then I also have some more slides of what's, what else is going on at the survey uh, after this. So, but I want to focus on this for a minute. Yeah. Um, so I, I would love to find dinosaurs. That would be great. <laughs> um, mostly um, we find uh, clams and other people, never me, find um, ammonites. And ammonites are, uh, they're really useful for dating rocks of this age because they changed really quickly. And so um, if you find one, you can, they're pretty easy to identify and you can know what age they are. So, so other types of fossils, but not usually dinosaurs. But, yeah. Where was that spring that we filled? Uh, was it intermittent at all? It, I guess it's intermittent. I mean, I didn't see it yeah, go again. <laughs> no, it didn't. So, I, yeah, I don't know the timing. Um, we were out there to sample them and had to keep moving. <laughs> but, yeah, it's on the Garden Gulch Quadrangle on the west side. There's a, there's a bunch of them there. And, they, and they've been known to be there um, through the years. Uh, so, but this will be the first time we'll sample the gases from them. Yeah. So how much of the formations is predictive of oil deposits? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, it depends on what kind of um, reservoir you're looking for. So if you're looking for a, say, a more conventional reservoir, which would be like a, a sandstone that hosts oil, say, um, you, you could, you know, we can use what we see in the outcrop to better interpret what we see in the subsurface. So, so we could know more where the sands might be. Because, <laughs> um, you know, in the subsurface, all we can do is, like, we, do, we just have wells, mostly. Um, there's seismic data, but I don't usually have access to that. So um, I have like point data, essentially. So I have a well here, a well here, a well there. And, um, and the data I get from that well is um, a geophysical log, which I have to interpret. I have to say, oh, that's a sandstone. Oh, that has oil in it. Or, you know, so there's some interpretation there. And then I have to connect it to another one. So um, you know, very, very quickly, if they're far away, you're, you're having to make some um, big interpretations. And so when we see these rocks in the outcrop, it's really helpful for us to, to interpret the surface. Um, but so, so when you talk about a basin, you're pooling water, not oil. Um, no, both. Well, it depends. <laughs> a lot of times, water um, keeps the oil in place. <laughs> um, there's, you know, a basin, a basin in this sense is a really large area. Um, and 
it's not necessarily um, a low spot in today's world. Uh, it could be. Some of these are, uh, but they're the the rocks that are you know underground are usually have some sort of geometry like that. Uh, but then they're they're often filled in with younger rocks that are laying more flat. Um, so there you know there's groundwater more near the surface, and then the oil and gas reservoirs are going to be a lot deeper. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Yeah, no, you did. Okay. <laughs> So when you're looking at the Mesa Verde group, <clears throat> is it pretty easy to distinguish the different formations in it? From the slides, they, they look pretty similar. Well, no, it's not easy. <laughs> but the first map I did was that one. That was really helpful. Um, it's just big stripes. <laughs> So I could really like pin it down on this map. Um, once I was able to see it and tune in my eyes, it became a lot easier. Uh, then I go to other places and it, it's more clear. So if you just walked out on the outcrop without this map, you'd have trouble distinguishing the different. I don't think I would now on this whole eastern side of the Greater Green River Basin, but I, I would have then. I spent a lot of time at this on this map trying to figure out the formations. Yeah. <laughs> and so they're all sandstone. They're all sandstones. <laughs> yeah. There's differences in formation. There are, yeah. Yeah. But you can actually see them once you tune them. You can see them, and they, you know, they make up, like, this This one is all, is, you see how it's, like, wider? Yes. Um, that's the Pine Ridge sandstone, and it always makes a ridge. And then always on the, the up, you know, stratigraphically upside of it, the dip slope of it is the almond. So that's helpful. <laughs> These are big continuous sands in the Haystack Mountains, and then the Allen Ridge just kind of fills in between, and the sands are not very continuous. They, they, don't, they don't fill out the, you know, the whole outcrop. They're, just, they're mostly fluvial, so they're, um, they, they're, you know, they're hundreds of meters wide, but not tens of kilometers. Right. And there are fossil markers in some of them? There are. Um, I'm not very good at finding fossils. <laughs> Other people have found them and we use their data. <laughs> yeah. So, Rainy, you uh, said that about 10 years ago, those uh, bubbling springs yeah. had been sampled, and so our analysis from those, mm -hmm. um, what kinds of gases did they find? They didn't sample the gases, or if they, oh, 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 oh. If they did, they're yeah. not um, published, that we can find. Ooh, ooh. So, if anybody knows about it, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you might comment to everybody that's an area of the state that has undergone a lot of natural gas development yeah. in the last yeah. 20 years or so. There's, there's rumors of being able to light them on fire by yeah. the locals, um, which would suggest that they're you know, natural gas. They're probably methane. They may not all be. And you know, I really don't know, to be honest. Um, I, I'm really interested to see what the final results are. Because there could be a lot of CO2 in them. Could you comment on the, uh, the sources for the natural gas and, and these uh, Cretaceous rocks that are so important for, yeah. Produ for production? Yeah. Um, well, so so on the was well, so in the area you're talking about a lot of the sources. There's a lot of coal bed natural gas in that area, so there's lots of coal. Um, in but but the main natural gas production from these rocks would be the um, shales that are either interbedded with it or um, beneath it, mostly beneath it. Um, so that'd be like the steel shale. There's the Nyabrera is deeper than that, the Maori. These are all um, organic rich source rocks that um, are completely mature and all the hydrocarbons would have moved up into a lot of these formations. That's what pays our bills. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Any other questions on this? How long does it take you to do one of those quadrangle maps? Oh, I didn't and, say that. You're right. And uh, I mean, I see you have to do things in an office once in a while. How do you do both of those? It's sad, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so um, we've changed our schedule, our new schedule for the map. So we, we have a year to do the maps. 
which is fast. Um, the USGS in the past used to do quadrangle maps in two years. Um, so we have one field season. The title of them is always preliminary geologic map of the blah, blah, blah quadrangle for a reason. Um, but, but, but if summer's enough, there's been a lot of work done out in these places in the past, so we can use other people's um, mapping also. Um, so we map for a lot of the summer. I usually put in 20 to 30 days in the, of field work. So, you know, five weeks, something like that. And then, um, then we're drafting the maps through the winter and they're due um, in like April. So um, it works pretty well. Yeah. Have you observed the Cretaceous tertiary time tank in Angus through Manhattan? Uh, yeah, except it's... Do you see it, it, surface <laughs> on the other surface? It's in. Can you repeat the question? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, he was asking if uh, I've observed the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, which is a big deal, the KT boundary, um, in any of this mapping. I'll say that I have mapped it, but I haven't seen it. If that makes any sense, I, it's in. Oh, it's in this rock. <clears throat> Somewhere, I don't know. Probably up here. Um, <laughs> this is the Red Rim Sandstone. It's the upper part of the Lance Formation. And uh, the, near the top of it, there's a thin gravel surface that is supposed to represent the boundary. Uh, and I cannot find it. And it. But there has been some work done with pollen. And so the, there's Cretaceous pollen. And then at the top, there's a, there's a gap. And then there's, there's Paleocene pollen and not the lowest part of the Paleocene. So there's a time gap, but the rock all looks exactly the same. You don't see any good regolith development? <laughs> no. Really no, I wish. But there is a time gap there. Yeah. Yeah. You can see here, this says 1897. Somebody carved the year, but they didn't carve their name. Rainy might, uh, there might be somebody, maybe not, but there might be somebody in here who doesn't. And the significance of the KT boundary. So. <laughs> um, well, the KT boundary is when we had um, significant change in life. <laughs> uh, so essentially, we had you know the the end of the dinosaurs, um, and we had a big change in. Um, in, in, in weather conditions. It got a lot more hot and it got a lot more humid. Um, and and in, in our area, what's interesting is um, that there is, at this boundary, like I said, there, there is supposed, there's time missing. Um, so so we, we had rocks you know, that were exposed. They must have been eroded away. Um, things happened, but we, we, it's hard to figure out you know, exactly, um, exactly what. And there's people who study mammals across that time period. There's people who study pollen, um, various other things. So, yeah. Okay, well, let me show you. Um, okay, I, I just want to talk to you a little bit about some of the stuff at the survey that we've been doing. Because, you know, we're on the other side of the state, so you don't always know what's happening. Except this would be easier to get out of this and do it. Okay, a quiz. Which one doesn't belong? Okay, this is an easy quiz. Does anybody know what this is? Yeah, it's a tapir. Um, a tapir is this weird animal <laughs> that we don't see in, in uh, North America anymore. There's been a tapir fossil discovered in the uh, Green River Formation, which is known for you know, the fossil fish, our, our state fossil. And uh, it's really cool. Um, it's, it, no one expected it to be there. It's the first time it's, one of these has been found. Uh, and uh, so it was found by um, Rick Hebden of War, Warfield Fossil Quarries. And it was found on a state, a state lease. So he had to um, give it to the state. Um, it was really great that he did. Uh, because this fossil is going to be really interesting. Um, it was in four large slabs, another box of smaller pieces. Um, Dr. Gray Gunnell of Duke identified it as a tapir. I, I couldn't identify it as a tapir. <laughs> um, and then it's been prepared 
for, um, for scientific study. And so here's some pictures of there's four different types of tapirs in the world today. Um, and just with some, a few notes, because this is the largest known mammal that's been found in the Green River Formation. Um, it's the first of its kind. There's an argument that it could be a new species of tapir or tapiroid. And um, if, if it is, you can make the argument that, that tapirs um, originated in North America. This is a long shot. We're not sure. This hasn't been studied yet. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how, what happens. Um, this is what it looks like. Well, here you go. So here's what are these? Each of these is a centimeter. So these are, you know, these are sort of big slabs like this. Um, here's a foot. I think these are some ribs. Um, here's some more feet. These feet are actually really cool. You can see how they're, there's like split. They're, I don't know, their bones are sort of split on the ends of the toes. And um, so it's not, it's not complete. It's missing its head. The person who discovered it, unfortunately, discovered it by putting a shovel through its head. Um, but it's also really friable. So um, you can't even transport these slabs above 30 degrees. They have to lay flat. If they're above 30 degrees, they'll collapse. Um, so they're, they're, um, they're, they're really fragile. Um, no, there was no soft tissue. We were hoping that there would be some, um, which would really have helped with studying it. And this is cool. Before it got prepared, um, we took it to the hospital <laughs> and to one of the um, urgent care places, and they ran it through a CT scan and did an X-ray. And yeah, so um, a lot of so these are some. There's a lot of ribs in here, and then there's a lot of um, roots. So it, it was really hard for the person to prepare it, but this really helped them um, to know what was, you know to to know what to expect. And so here's sort of what it looked like, you know. So this is just the tip of one of these feet. So that was before and that was after. Um, with this like shadowing light, um, the person who prepared it was able to, to do a pretty good job. Um, stabilized it pretty well. Um, tried to do a reversible adhesive in case somebody needs to study it more in the future. Um, and then it's been, you know, specially photographed and 3D imaged. I think they can, they're going to print 3D versions of it. Um, we can't make casts of it. It's too fragile. And, oh my gosh, aren't these babies cute? <laughs> this is ridiculous. Um, <laughs> so, so we had an open house at the survey. Actually, last week we had over 400 people come, which is amazing for our little office. Um, it was really great. Um, it's, it's, it's went to the State Museum in Cheyenne uh, yesterday, and there's an open house for it on Thursday. If you know anybody in Cheyenne, tell them to go. It's, kinda, it's pretty neat to see. Um, it's going to stay there all winter, and then um, come spring, we're hoping to get it to other places in the state. Uh, we're hoping it'll go to Kemmerer and any other, probably Thermopolis um, at some point, and you know, any other place that um, wants it. And we're hoping somebody will um, study it, because <laughs> it's ready to go. Let's see, some of the other things we've been doing. Oh, and there's, if you go to our website, you can find tons more information on the tapir. There's like a video of the preparation, and um, there's, there's a lot of information. <clears throat> All right, so in groundwater, we've been doing lots of uh, salinity reports, trying to figure out the salinity in some of these basins, um, a statewide groundwater salinity at a very sort of large scale, and doing these um, ground, basin groundwater plans um, where we look at a basin and um, uh, look at the available groundwater in it, and these are, these are big, huge reports that the survey does. In terms of oil and gas, um, this goes to your dinosaur question, except these are mostly ammonites. This is a correlation chart of the, all the upper Cretaceous in all the basins in the state based on ammonites over here. Um, so this was, um, this was one of my big projects this last year. This has helped um, to remember the names of all the formations. Um, we've looked at you know, various formations in terms of their oil production trends. The, the, the Codell is a big producer in the Denver Basin, trying to figure out you know, why <laughs> and how to get more oil out of it, um, in, in sort of in a, um, without drilling more holes. Um, 
and then looked at uh, potential for frac sand in the state. There isn't any. Um, looking at the Wall Creek and Turner, this is the, the most productive reservoir in the state at the moment um, in the Powder River Basin, making uh, maps. This is just showing um, where there is oil highs in areas like this. Again, this is the Powder River Basin. Um, and we've also been compile compiling a whole database of subsurface reservoir tops. Um, we're trying to make that available to the public soon so anybody can download it and make the same maps we're mapping um, based on our interpretations, I guess. Um, coal, we've been looking at coal availability throughout the entire Greater Green River Basin. Um, this report should be out in the fall. It's almost ready to go. Um, there's a lot of coal there. It's really hard to mine. We've been doing more maps. Um, I'm not involved with any of these, but these three are all in the Southern Medicine Bow range. They're really colorful. There's lots of uh, metamorphic rocks in here. Um, they've been really hard to map. <laughs> um, and then the Gas Hills map, um, looking at uranium. These are all out. Um, this year we're doing, I told you I was doing Garden Gulch on this map that's here. Um, we're also doing Horatio Rock, which is part of the Southern Medicine Bows. It's a continuation in Lincoln Dome up in the Granite Mountains. So we keep doing like three or four maps a year, um, keep chugging them out. And then we've been doing lots of outreach, um, lots of kid events, lots of, this is the new thing we've been doing. I put some pamphlets actually out on the um, front table when you guys came in. There are, um, the, for this, we've been trying to do geology of the state parks. The only two we've done so far are Kurt Gowdy and Seminoe. Uh, three more in the works. They should be out by next summer. These have been kind of fun. Um, and so please go to our website. There's tons of information on there. We try to keep it really current. Um, it's our 85th year. <laughs> you can do things like, you know, sign up for a newsletter, um, report an earthquake or a landslide. There, we have all these interactive maps now on the website. They're all um, ArcGIS based, but they're web based, so you don't have to have the program to use them. If you can't figure out how to use them, call us. We can walk you through it. Um, and you can, you know, follow us on Twitter or Facebook or whatever you might do. Um, and I think that's it. Well. Any questions about any of that? <laughs> you said you apply for grants from the U.S. government, but does the state uh, indicate what tasks they want you to accomplish in a given amount of time? Um, so, at what level do you mean? Like, well, you, you as the state person are applying, you said, to the U.S. government for grants for the map making. Map mm -hmm. making. Mm -hmm. um, but are there other parts of your, I mean, you have many other projects, are those mostly dictated by the state? Or? Are, so the, all, the, all the other projects are um, ones that mostly we've come up with them. Um, sometimes there are outside suggestions. We're happy to take suggestions of what, you know, we're, we try to do work that we think will benefit the state because um, that's what we're here to do. <laughs> um, and yeah, just we try to stay relevant as much as we can. But yeah, but we do have an advisory board um, who helps. I know, and, and they're, they're from all over the state and they meet with the director regularly. Who makes the call as to which, uh, where you go with the next map that you're doing? Uh... Well, you know, we've been trying to keep them focused in terms of projects that we're working on. So, like, there's, you know, some, like, the Gas Hills area. There's a person who studies uranium and, you know, is trying to keep his work in that area. Um, we have a mapping advisory committee. It's the same as our survey advisory committee. <laughs> um, we're happy to take suggestions, certainly. Um, so like this year, um, I'm trying a different plan. And so I'd like, there's a few key 1 to 100,000 scale maps that are not done for the state. Um, and Firehole Canyon's one of them, which is down by south of Rock Springs. And there's been a lot of mapping done there, but the, the larger map hasn't been done. So we're going to do a, the, the rest of the 1 to 24,000 scale maps. Um, 
so we can do the larger map here in the next few years. So, I mean, there's sort of all kinds of reasons that we've done them. <laughs> yeah. Anybody, anybody mapping in your team and for resort? The, uh, the Granite uh, Mountains. Zone? Oh, well, so there's, there's mapping in the Granite Mountains. The Lincoln Dome is currently being mapped, and that has some um, really old rocks. <laughs> um, yeah, and then there are, there are also all the mapping in the Southern Medicine Bow Range. Um, some of it, I think, hits the Cheyenne Belt, I think. I haven't mapped those. <laughs> yeah. Have you had any big surprises when you've been out in the field? I don't know. I didn't expect this other than this bubble and cauldron business. Wildlife. <laughs> My field assistant saw a mountain lion this year. I didn't see it. Um, we've seen 19 rattlesnakes. Um, rock wise, I mean. You know, I mean, when you're just mapping rocks that are sort of in stripes, you, you kind of can expect what's going to be next. When, when they get really complicated and suddenly those rocks that are difficult to tell apart are folded and faulted, <laughs> that, that, that's when it becomes difficult and, and it is a surprise for sure. Yeah. One, one comment. Our local maps, many of them, uh, the geologic quads are on this site and you can find them for the Tetons and Mm -hmm. local area mm -hmm. uh, yeah it's listed as the dave love map group right but uh, you can download <laughs> them for free yeah yeah and there's also more maps on the u.s geological surveys website they, there's a they have a map interface and you can you know click on them and download them our maps are at the moment they're all up to date in their database as well but their database will send you back to our website <laughs> but so there's you know there's a little bit of both um, but yeah everything's free you know if you if you want it digitally my question also is the uranium. What, where is it found, and what, what's its source, and which rocks is, are, are, is it in? In the Gas Hills area? Is that where Wyoming's the, uranium all is? Um, no, it's all over the place. <laughs> okay, so it's mostly in. I'm in generalized, but it's mostly in rocks that are, um, ter well, paleos, paleogene and neogene. So they're. <laughs> You know, they're maybe 50 million years old to 30 to 20 million year old rocks. Um, a lot of them are, so, that, so they're younger rocks in the state. They've been a lot of the basin fill. They're, they're some of the, you know, flatter lying rocks. They've filled in the basins um, once the basins formed. And, um, you know, the, people have argued where the source of the uranium is. Um, I think that, you know, that probably the, the best argument, in my opinion, is that it's, it's come you know, from the erosion of some of these mountain ranges, like the Granite Mountains, uh, and then um, it's moved out into the basins, and, then, and, we, and it's just naturally doing that. There's natural uranium in those rocks. Um, but then when it hits a reducing environment, so any place where there's, say, um, organic material, it'll, it'll fall out of solution, and it will deposit. Um, in a location like that. So, um, so you can get it, you know, sort of coming off the mountains out into the basin and then it sort of hits, <laughs> I don't know, hits organic material or whatever else can be reducing. Um, and then it sort of stops at that location. And so that's, that's why it's, you know, in, in the basins mostly. Yeah. What's the total number of people employed by the Wyoming Geologists? I should know that, shouldn't I? <laughs> 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 it changes. <laughs> Every year is a little bit different. Um, there's maybe 22 employees, something like that. They're not. Everybody's not a geologist. You know, we have administrative staff. Um, we have what two people doing oil and gas, uranium, minerals, water. Um, Hazards, thank you. <laughs> what else do we have? <laughs> um, and we, we, have we have a lot of people doing like a lot of different things. So the person who did the tapir fossil, that was the, you know, we don't have a paleontologist on staff, so um, it was the first time she dealt with anything like that, and she did an awesome job. Uh, a few slides back, you mentioned the survey's looking at large coal deposits that are difficult to mine. I know mm -hmm. that's not your project, but what kind of difficulties are they getting Oh. I meant that very generally. No, I mean, there isn't much mining 
of that coal. I mean, so, so okay, that project is the Fort Union Formation, um, and there's a lot of thin, laterally continuous coal beds um, that some of them extend across much of the basin. Um, so the reason they're not um, very mineable is because they're either too deep or they're too thin. Uh, but there, there is still quite a coal resource in that area. So, uh, but, and part of the uh, Black Butte mine, they do mine some of the, the um, Fort Union coals, uh, sort of along I-80 there, um, east of Rock Springs. It's probably a report that won't be used for quite some time. <laughs> yeah. well, All right. There, well, there thanks. Are no more questions. Uh, we're going to do the usual thing with the chairs.